everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on industrial chemistry. And in the previous lesson we looked at emulsions. And what that is going what that is building towards is our study of synthetic detergents, which is the focus of today's lesson. So synthetic detergents are simply like soaps, cleaning agents developed from petrochemicals. Okay? Um, so we're going to look at the different types and what each of them is used for. Okay? So firstly, surfactants old and new. Soaps made with fats and oils were the main cleaning agent until the 1940s. So using animal fats to make soaps or vegetable oils to make soap was the major process until about the 1940s. Now during the 1940s, synthetic detergents were developed. When oil became you know, a useful thing that people knew how to deal with, we started developing all sorts of different chemicals from it. And these detergents can clean even in hard water. So the major disadvantage of soap was that if our water supply wasn't very good, and we had a very hard water supply, we couldn't use soap. Whereas now, with these new detergents, we found that we could use them even in hard water. And today, these synthetic detergents have, made, have replaced older soaps to a pretty large extent. So we don't really see soap being used outside of maybe some specialty areas, like just um, personal hygiene and things. We see synthetic detergents being used as cleaning agents pretty much everywhere. So, alkyl benzene sulfonoates. Okay, so complex name, but most synthetic detergents are alkyl benzene sulfonoates. Okay. So alkyl benzenes are organic compounds made out of benzene and long alkanes. Okay, so this is our benzene ring. It's a hexagon, and it's attached to a long hydrocarbon chain. Right. So we should remember benzene from production of materials. Um, it helps to make the um, St uh, the styrene monomer. Okay. It's also known as a carcinogen as well, just as a side. So both of these are readily available in the petrochemical refining industry. Long hydrocarbon chains and benzene rings are pretty commonplace in petrochemical or petrochemistry. Okay. So what we do is we have. So this is our. This is our. What we represent as our. Alkane chain this R, and then here's our benzene ring. Okay, So no need to worry, this is just a chain here. And what we do is we add it to sulfuric acid. So we treat it with sulfuric acid to form what we call an artificial fatty acid. So here we have our artificial fatty acid here. So it's that long hydrocarbon chain R with a benzene ring, a, sulf uh, a sulfite group, and a H. Okay, And we also get H2O as well. Okay. Now, the alkyl benzene sulfonoic acid reacts with sodium hydroxide to form a soap-like synthetic detergent. So now we take this, uh, this alkyl benzene sulfonoic acid, which is just this thing here, we react it with sodium hydroxide, similar to what we do with soap, right? We make soap by turning an, a fatty acid, an organic fatty acid, into a soap by adding sodium, hyd sodium hydroxide. So we're doing a similar process here. And what happens is we get, an, we get this, which is the, the alkyl benzene sulfonoate with sodium and more water. Okay? And this thing is a soap, or it acts like a soap. So this is the more structural version of that diagram. So we've got lots of Cs. This is our, sulf, our um, sulfonoic acid group, and this is our sodium. So a typical example is sodium dodecobenzene sulfonoate. Okay, so this is um, our sodium dodecobenzene sulfonoate um, detergent. So like soap anions, synthetic detergent molecules have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic end. Okay, so just exactly like soap, we've got this uh, water-hating region and this water-loving region or this water loving head. Okay? Uh, and the action is similar. It allows them to bind to grease and water. However, the anion does not form an insoluble precipitate with magnesium or calcium ions. Okay? So because of it's synthetic, it doesn't form magnesium or calcium precipitates, which means it can work in hard water. 
Now, the thing is, not all of them are anionic. Not all synthetic detergents are anionic. We have other types as well. So there are three types. Cationic, so that sort of implies it's got a positive head. Anionic, which is what I just mentioned. And non-ionic detergents, OK? And we'll go through what each of them is in a moment. So anionic detergents. Um, so we're used to these types. The anion of the detergent does the work. They're used in dishwashing liquids and powders. Um, hand soaps, so there's liquid soaps that, you, that they advertise all the time. Toothpaste and laundry detergent. Um, they work really well um, for, for th cleaning things that absorb a lot of water, particularly things like cotton, where, you, where they absorb a lot of water. These are quite useful. And they're quite sudsing, so they produce a lot of bubbles and foam a lot. Now, cationic detergents, um, instead of having a negatively charged head, you've got a positively charged head. Okay? And this allows them to, to bind with the, the grease in the same way as the anionic one. But, and it still allows them to bind with water, just the opposite end of the water, because it's positively charged. So the positively charged end is an ammonium salt. Okay? So it's usually um, some kind of ammonium compound. They're used for slightly different purposes to anionic detergents, simply because they're constructed differently. So glass, china, and fibers tend to acquire a slight negative charge over time. So that little staticky charge tends to accumulate on some fibers. Um, this means that cationic detergents stick to them and form a waxy coating, which is sometimes good, sometimes bad. This is bad for glass and china because it makes them slippery. So what happens is, let's say we've got a cup. Okay, It tends to build up all this negative charge. So all these soap molecules tend to stick to it. And that makes them waxy and greasy. And that's bad for glass, because we don't, we don't want to, to drop them. However, it's good for fabrics and hair conditioners, because by removing those negative charges, tends to make them feel a little bit softer and a little bit less um, harsh. So they use this fabric softeners a lot. Um, cationic detergents are also mildly antiseptic, so they tend to kill some bacteria types. And they're used in hair conditioners, as I mentioned, to get rid of that negative charge. Nappy washers, fabric softeners, and some domestic disinfectants. Okay, so very, very, so slightly different. Um, applications compared to anionic detergents. And non-ionic detergents. So they contain an oxygen atom joining two long non-polar groups. Okay? So basically it forms hydrogen bonds with the water. So the oxygen atoms form hydrogen bonds with the water molecules and the non-polar groups bind to the grease obviously. This means that the detergent can clean objects without ionizing and so you know, there's no extra ions lying around. So non-ionic detergents do not lather very much, simply because they're charged less. Um, so this makes them useful for dishwashers and front-loading washing machines. So if you've ever seen a front-loading washing machine, it just kind of swells around and the water just kind of stays there. You don't really want a lot of sudsing, otherwise you'll get, you know, that comical situation of having foam everywhere throughout your laundry. Um, they can also be added to other detergents to reduce the amount of lather. Okay, so you can use these to kind of reduce the lathering of other detergents. So non-ionic detergents are not as irritating as other detergents, simply because they're less charged, so they don't draw as much water away. And they're used in dishwashing fluid, car shampoos, paints, and cosmetics. Okay. So this concludes our talk on basically what's, what different synthetic detergents are. So we've looked at what an anionic, a cationic, and a non-ionic surfactant are, and what their applications are. So we'll move on to the question segment, and we'll see if we can put all of it together to answer questions. So which is true about all detergents? So detergents are ionic substances. Well, obviously, we talked about non-ionic detergents, so that's not true. Detergents contain sodium. Sodium is usually, but not always, an ingredient for anionic detergents, but definitely not one for cationic or non-ionic. So 
that's not true. All detergents behave in exactly the same way. No, again, that's not true. Cationic, anionic, and non-ionic detergents behave differently because of the way they're charged. Um, this is obviously the last one, the answer. Detergents can form bonds with both water and grease. Yes, that's what allows detergents to work in the first place. They form bonds with the grease and bonds with the water, and when you agitate them, it pulls the oil apart. Which of the following is a non-ionic detergent? So sodium hexadecalbenzene sulfonoate is probably an anionic detergent because of the sulfonoate group, so it's ionic. Trimethyl hexadecal ammonium chloride. The ammonium chloride instantly tells you that it's probably cationic, so it's again ionic. Sodium octadecanoate. The, again, because of the sodium, because it's gone away, you will form a negative charge at the end. So this dissociates and you'll have an octadecanoate ion, so again it's ionic. So this must be it. Polyoxyethylene lauryl ether, or ether. This does not dissociate with water. The, polyo the polyoxyethylene end of the molecule can form hydrogen bonds and the lauryl end can form dispersion forces. So this is a non-ionic detergent. So just by looking at the ends of the names, you can sort of tell which one's which. Um, but it's quite complicated if you try to draw them and things like that. Is a detergent made of these molecules an anionic, cationic, or non-ionic detergent? Assume that any unlabeled vertices represent carbon atoms saturated with hydrogen. Okay, so these just mean carbon with all the appropriate hydrogens. Okay, this molecule dissociates into an Na plus cation and a long anion with a polar head. So this is an anionic substance. Okay, Because you can see this is going to go away and we're going to have a negative charge here. So it's going to be an anionic surfactant. So same question. This chloride will probably go away. The chloride becomes a chloride ion and you get a positive head here, which means that it's going to be a cationic substance. Okay, so when Cationic detergents are used to clean a window. They leave behind a greasy residue. But when anionic detergents are used instead, they leave no residue. Explain why. Glass tends to build up negative charge over time. That's just a natural occurrence. So when a cationic detergent is used to clean the window, the positive head of the molecule forms a bond with the glass, leaving the hydrocarbon tail pointing outwards. And that produces that greasy residue. Anionic detergents do not form bonds with the glass, and so don't leave that residue behind. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on synthetic detergents. So hopefully you've seen what each of the synthetic detergents are and what their applications are. So in the next lesson we'll talk about what are the environmental um, issues associated with these detergents, and so I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.